Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem. We are with Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series. All our lectures are available on YouTube. There's a Telegram group which you can join to access all lecture related information. We have a Google Drive where all the PDF of lectures are available. These are the disclaimers and we are with Phase 3 which is Recorded Pathology Lectures. And we have Pursue 26 which is Dermatopathology. And today we have 26Y which is epidermal tumors and we are streaming from Ames Bhatinda and to speak on that we have Dr. Gargi Kapatia. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology at Ames Bhatinda. She has done her MBBS from UCMS Delhi, her MD in PGI Chandigarh and a DNB. She has also done a PDCC in renal and transplant pathology. Her areas of interest being cytopathology, renal and transplant pathology, immunofluorescence, histopathology and electron microscopy. She's got more than 50 publications in international and national journals. She has been the recipient of the best paper award in the annual conference of Dermatopathology Society of India. Second prize in poster presentation in pediatric pathology CME in 2018. Second prize in poster presentation in renal transplant pathology in the CME at 2019. First prize in quiz in Cytocon 2019. So I would request Dr. Gargi Kapatia to start her lectures on epidermal tumors. Ma'am, please. Good morning, everyone. So today's topic for the discussion is epidermal tumors. So I will be covering both benign as well as the malignant epidermal tumors. So according to the WHO, epithelial tumors can be uh, divided into benign tumors and malignant tumors. So the benign tumors comprise of epidermal nevus, the boric character Clear cell acanthoma, which is also known as nevus comaginicus, epidermolytic acanthoma, acantholytic acanthoma, oral white sponge nevus, fibroepithelial polyp, warty disc keratoma, actinic keratosis, keratoacanthoma, and benign lichenoid keratosis. The malignant epidermal tumors predominantly comprise of basically two major types of tumors that is squamous cell carcinoma and more common basal cell carcinoma. Both of these tumors have different various subtypes which we will discuss in subsequent slides. So these are the other, uh, flat, uh, other variants of basal cell carcinoma. So coming to the first benign entity which we are going to discuss that is epidermal nevus which is also known as varicose epidermal nevus which can be either localized or systemat systematized so as the name suggests it is a type of um, epidermal nevus which shows hyperkeratosis papillomatosis and acanthosis with elongation of the retinal ridges so in this photograph we can see this hyperkeratosis and papillomatosis very nicely Coming to the second benign category, which is commonly encountered in our routine reporting, that is the boric keratosis. So it arises mainly in four to fifth decade, chest and the back, mainly the hair bearing area are the common areas. So the clinical morphology comprises of this round, flat, coin like waxy plaques that vary from millimeters to several centimeters. So color is basically tan to dark brown. And they have velvety to granular surface as can be seen. So if there is sudden appearance or increase in size of these lesions, it is usually associated with internal malignancies and this sign is known as lesser trilat sign. So coming to a peculiar histopathology of seboric keratosis, it has various variants but the common features of all these variants is that most of the cells have basal white appearance as seen in this photograph and there are many horn cysts or pseudocysts which are present. In addition, there is hyperkeratosis, acanthosis and papillomatosis in these lesions. The acanthosis is basically due to upward extension of the tumor instead of downward extension. So the lower border of the tumor is even and it generally lies on a straight line which is drawn from the normal epidermis at the one end of the tumor to the normal epidermis at the other end. So coming to the subtypes one by one, first is the irritated type. The irritated type shows predominantly lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate in the upper dermis. 
and their presence of intraepithelial squamous eddies, which are composed of whirling aggregates of eosinophilic squamous cells. So in this type, the squamous cells outnumber the basaloid cells. These eddies may be confused with the horn pearls of squamous cell carcinoma, but we have to differentiate these horn pearls from the squamous eddies on the basis of their large number, their size is small and they are more circumscribed. So other features which can be noted in such type are apoptotic cells, occasional dyskeratosis, acanthalosis and here in this spongy. So coming to the second type, reticulated type. So the reticulated type is basically, uh, the name is given on this reticulated pattern of the disease which is formed by this branching and interweaving extensions from the epidermis of this basal white epidermal cells along with this horn cells which can be seen in the photomicrograph. The third type is a hyperkeratotic type as the name suggests so it's pronounced hyperkeratosis. In addition, the appearance is varicose with elongated projections with pronounced papillomatosis and horn cells are also noted. Hyperpigmentation is unusual in such cases. Coming to the next type that is acanthotic type. So acanthotic type is the most common type of seboric keratosis with marked acanthosis. There is papillomatosis, hyperkeratosis, but acanthosis is marked. There are presence of horn cysts and pseudocysts. However, squamous eddies are peculiarly absent in acanthotic type. So coming to the acantholytic type. So in acantholytic type, there will be acantholysis, which is seen. So it is located in the face and scalp and acantholysis is seen almost exclusively in the squamous nest and mesodiskeratosis and spongiosis between or around the horn cyst. The next entity is the clonal type. So the hallmark of this type is that there are sharply demarcated intraepithelial nest of basal oil cells. Sometimes they may resemble basal cell epithelioma since the nuclei appear small and dark and intercellular bridges are seen only in few areas but the horn cysts take the diagnosis towards seboric keratosis. For the pigmented type, it is often seen in acanthotic and reticulated subtypes in which the melanin pigment is much more. The pigment is present mainly within the basal keratinocytes, although there is a lesion which is melanoacanthoma, a rare type of pigmented seboric keratosis where there is a marked increase in melanocytes which contain melanin pigment. So coming to our next benign entity that is clear cell acanthoma. So morphologically it is an intraepithelial tumor. It is composed of clear glycogen filled keratinocytes associated with dermal inflammation. So important is intraepithelial location, clear glycogen filled keratinocytes and dermal inflammation. So what does it look like clinically? It is a slow growing, sharply delineated red nodules which are 1 to 2 cm in diameter and usually covered with thin crust which exudes some moisture. Typically these lesions are solitary and they occur on the legs. Coming on the histology of clear cell acanthoma. So they are sharply demarcated area of epidermis and they appear strikingly clear and enlarged cells. The nuclei of the clear epidermal cells appear normal and PAs reveal presence of large amount of glycogen in these cells. The conspicuous feature is there may be present of these neutrophils throughout the epidermis. So dermal inflammation, intraepithelial tumor and glycogen which can be highlighted on PS stain are features of clear cell acanthoma. The next common entity is fibroepithelial polyp. I'm sure everyone must have seen the skin tag. It is also known as skin tag. So it is a soft flesh colored pedunculated papule which resemble a polyp. They have a smooth or folded surface may be present in various locations like axilla, neck, inframemory region, eyelids. On light microscopy, they are polypoid. There is stroma which is covered by this papillomatous, papillomatous epidermis. We must know that it is not an entity. It is a pattern of growth. 
it can be result from various diseases or other benign processes which include seborrheic keratosis or warts next benign entity is warty disc keratoma so this is also a solitary lesion mostly which occurs in scalp face or neck so clinical appearance may not be always distinctive it is a slightly elevated papule as seen or maybe a nodule as seen in this clinical photograph with a keratotic umbilicated center Usually on histopathology, in watery disc keratoma, we can see a circumscribed lesion, which is a cup shade and invaginating inside. It extends into the underlying dermis. There is a central depression, which is usually filled with keratinous material. There can be suprabasilar clefting, and we can see numerous acantholytic or disc keratotic cells within the lacuna. The dermal papilla may show dilated vessels, occasional melanophages and flu inflammatory cells. So circumscription, invagination into underlying del dermis, central depression with keratinous material, suprabasilar clefting which comprise of acantholytic and dyskeratotic cells are peculiar features of what is dyskeratoma. Coming to the next benign lesion that is actinic keratosis. Clinically, they range from few millimeters to one centimeter in size, predominantly seen in sun-exposed parts, may occur in lip, in renal transplant patients, in these patients. On the lip location, we say that it is actinic colitis. Morphologically, clinically, it is erythematous, scaly macule or papule or have a rough sandpaper like consistency as we can see in this clinical photograph. Some lesions produce so much keratin that a cutaneous horn can also be produced on these kind of lesions. The various causes which include sunlight, ionizing radiation, industrial hydrocarbons, arsenic and xeroderma pigmentosa. So coming to the light microscopy of actinic keratosis. 20% of the patients, such patients may develop squamous cell carcinoma in one or more of the lesions. So it's a kind of pre-malignant lesion and we must report and see it correctly. It is known as keratinocytic dysplasia or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. What we see on histopathology are tall columns of parakeratotic keratin which alternate with moderate bands of orthokeratotic keratin with moderate atypia of the underlying keratinocytes. So here we can see this parakeratosis that is nuclei in the stratum corneum and this band of orthokeratosis. So there is alternate banding and the underlying keratinocytes show this atypia. We can see this moderate atypia in this higher magnification and we can very well appreciate it. The various clinical as well as microscopic variants of this entity. So, first of all, we will discuss about a cantholytic variety of actinic keratosis. In a cantholytic variety, as the name suggests, there will be clefts, there will be a cantholytic cells ab above the atypical cells in the basal layer. The epidermis is hyperkeratotic, there is lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate, and there is a cantholytic change. Next entity is bovinoid actinic keratosis, which is also known as carcinoma in C2 and it involves the entire epithelium. There is a marked pleomorphism along with frequent mitosis, which may be atypical too. So the next lesion, next variant is hypertrophic actinic keratosis, which may show marked hyperkeratosis, papillomatosis, and prominent cytological atypia. Along with that, there may be moderate lymphocytic infiltrate in the underlying dermis. The other rare variants are atrophic variants which show minimal hyperkeratosis and only single layer of atypical basal cells and pigmented type where melanin in the basal layer and dendritic cells is present within the epithelium and there may be dermal pigment laden macrophages also. So coming to our next entity that is Bowen's disease 
It is an in situ form of squamous cell carcinoma skin that generally occurs in non sun exposed skin. So, coming to the morphology, it is slowly enlarging erythematous patch of sharp but irregular outline. So, we can see there is irregular outline. Within the patch, there are general areas of scaling or crusting may also be seen. So, coming to the light microscopy of the same. So, there is variety of atypical epithelial changes in the full thickness of epithelium which may be seen in these patients of Bowen's disease. These include cytoplasmic vacuolization, there is hyperchromasia of the nuclei, some keratinocytes may show multinucleation, there may be dyskeratosis of the keratinocytes, mitosis can be seen which may be also atypical. So, these are the various uh, features of Bowen disease which we need to look into when we see such cases. So coming to the differential diagnosis of the same. So how to differentiate Bowen's disease from bovinoid axillic keratosis? Most of the standard reference books tell that there are no histological difference between bovinoid axillic keratosis and Bowen's disease but they may be differ merely in size. So the clinical information is very much necessary for a diagnosis. The bovinoid actinic keratosis is usually smaller than the Bowen's disease. The other differential is Page's disease, which may share the presence of vacuolated cells, which we, may be seen in Page's disease also, but there is no dyskeratosis in Page's disease. In addition, we can use special stain to identify Page's cells which is PS positive and diastase resistant, whereas the Bowen's disease cells are PS positive and diastase libi. So Bowen's disease have major two differentials, bovinoid actinic keratosis and Page's disease. And bovinoid actinic keratosis to be differentiated on the basis of size, Page's disease on the basis of dyskeratosis and special state. Coming to the next entities that is cutaneous horn which is also known as cornucutaneum. Usually it is caused by actinic keratosis, seboric keratosis or in some cases squamous cell carcinoma. So clinically it is circumscribed, it is conical, it is markedly hyperkeratotic lesion with the height of the keratotic mass amounts at least half of its largest diameter. So here we can see this lesion clinically and this is the histopathological microphotograph is showing this marked hyperkeratosis the lesion comprised predominantly of keratin so cutaneous horn is a reaction pattern and not a specific lesion which will be caused by actinic keratosis seboric keratosis or squamous cell carcinoma coming to next common entity that is keratoacanthoma which occurs as a rapidly growing tumor on sun exposed skin. So the rapid growth sun exposed skin are important points. They may develop after trauma, laser or radiation therapy. It grows rapidly to a size of 1 to 2 cm over a period of 1 to 2 months and they tend to resolve spontaneously. So clinically they are dome shaped nodule. Diameter will vary from 1 to 2.5 cm. So, in the center, there is a horn filled crater with the buttress of a normal uninvolved epidermis at either side of the crater. So, something more about crater and canthoma their increased incidence is observed in immunosuppressed patients. They occur as a component of Murator syndrome of sebaceous neoplasms and they may be associated with visceral carcinomas also. There are major three rare clinical variants of solitary keratoganthoma. The first one is a giant keratoganthoma in which the size may go to 5 cm or maybe more and it may cause destruction of the underlying tissues and spontaneous involution takes place after several months. So normally the size is up to 2.5 cm and if it reaches more than 5 cm, 5 cm is known as giant keratoacanthoma. So next is keratoacanthoma centrifugum marginatum. The lesion may reach about 20 cm diameter, huge. No tendency towards spontaneous involution. Instead, 
peripheral extension with a raised rolled border and atrophy of the central lesion is noted. Third rare clinical variant is subungual keratoacanthoma, where there is destructive craterium lesion with keratotic excrescences under the distal portion of the fingernail. It fails to regress spontaneously, it is tender and may show damage to the terminal phalanx by pressure erosion. Keratoacanthomas can undergo transformation into squamous cell carcinomas like actinic keratosis either spontaneously or as a result of immunosuppression in such patients. Coming to the histopathology of the same, the on histopathological examination, we can see marked acanthosis, hyperkeratosis, little or no parakeratosis. So there is a big lesion which like a, which forms like a crater and there is uninvolved epidermis at the both ends. The underlying proliferative epithelium extends into the dermis comprised of cells with glassy appearing cytoplasm and bland nuclei. Nuclear proliferism, proteomorphism and mitotic activity may be observed. There are neutrophilic microabscesses. Tumors does not extend below the level of sweat glands. There may be pronounced inflammatory infiltrate and perineural and vascular invasion may be seen. So here we can see this uh, photograph which is showing the full view of this crater okanthoma. Here we can see this uh, crater which is filled with this uh, keratinous material and we can see this beautiful buttressing around this lesion of normal overlying epidermis. The definitive diagnosis of uh, such kind of lesions can be made if the entire lesion is sampled and it is displayed in cross section as was shown in the previous microphotograph. The classical microscopic features must be observed. There should be clear clinical description of the lesion, that is, the rapidly evolving cratery form lesion, which look like a crater. Because it is widely agreed by uh, many authors that squamous cell carcinomas can masquerade as keratocanthomas clinically as well as sometimes histologically. So uh, it is best uh, to be on the safe side in a doubtful case and to proceed on the assumption that the lesion is squamous cell carcinoma. Coming to the next entity that is benign lichenoid keratosis. These also uh, clinically are present as solitary papules. They are dusky red as shown in this clinical photograph may be violaceous and they are asymptomatic. So then they can present a chest and forearm and they represent an inflammatory stage of solar lentigo, actinic keratosis or seboric keratosis. So histopathologically, there is a characteristic lichenoid lymphocytic infiltrate leading to basal cell vacuolization in numerous apoptotic cells. There is hypergranulosis, hyperkeratosis with a frequent parakeratotic foci. The inflammatory infiltrate often extends around the superficial vascular plex. So differential diagnoses include lichenoid solar keratosis, which may show atypia of epidermal keratinocytes, lichen planus, in which the inflammatory cells do not extend to superficial vascular plexus, and furthermore, the parakeratosis. Plasma cells and eosinophils may be present in benign lichenoid keratosis. Similar changes may also be seen in lichenoid drug eruption. So clinical history specifically of uh, drug intake is important in such kind of cases. So coming to the malignant lesions of uh, epidermal tumors, we are done with the benign lesions. Now we first start with the squamous cell carcinoma, which is the second most common cutaneous malignancy after basal cell carcinoma. Grossly, it is an indurated papule or nodule with crusting and ulceration. Most commonly occurs in sun damaged skin, either as such or they may arise from actinic keratosis as previously discussed. Next to the sun damaged skin, squamous cell carcinomas arise most commonly in scars or bones or cessus ulcers, and this is termed as margulin's ulcer. It is a true invasive carcinoma of the surface epidermis. The tumor consists of irregular masses of epidermal cells 
that proliferate downward into the dermis. So there is a great variation in size and shape of the cells. There is hyperchromasia, keratinization of the individual cells and atypical mitotic fingers are also present. There may be horn pearls, which are characteristically seen as a concentric layer of squamous cells with gradually increasing keratinization towards the center. So we need to distinguish them from squamous eddies as previously discussed. So horn pearls are present in squamous cell carcinoma. So there are various variants of squamous cell carcinoma which we discussed, which constitutes spindle cell squamous cell carcinoma, also known as metaplastic carcinoma, acantholytic, also known as pseudoglandular type, adenosquamous, also known as mucin producing squamous cell carcinoma, and varicose carcinoma. Coming to the acantholytic or pseudoglandular squamous cell carcinoma, as the name suggests, there is acantholysis, there is dyskeratosis, and this acantholysis may result in tubular or alveolar formation. The acantholysis occurs due to reduction in the cell adhesion molecule, syndicate 1. There are formation of tubules, which is, may resemble glands, and this lumina may show these chromatid acantholytic cells. So, your photograph this is showing this tubules or lumina, which is these chromatid uh, acantholytic cells in the lumina. So, this is the acantholytic variant. So, due to the acantholysis, there is formation of pseudoglandular pattern, and lumina is filled with this these chromatid acantholytic cells. The next variant is adenosquamous carcinoma, which is also known as mucin producing squamous cell carcinoma. It is a particularly a rare variant and it is associated with more aggressive clinical groups. So there are varying number of mucin producing cells in this carcinoma and these cells are large, pain and stain positively with PS and mucicarmine stain and we can see this glandular formation and this uh, presence of this secretions which are PS positive in contrast to cantholytic type in which we see a cantholytic uh, cells inside the lumen. The next variant is the spindle squamous cell carcinoma or metaplastic carcinoma. So this kind of squamous cell carcinoma predominantly comprises entirely of spindle cells and are a variable component of more conventional squamous cell carcinoma. The spindle cells usually have a large vesicular nucleus, scant eosinophilic cytoplasm and often indistinct cell borders. There is variable degree of pleomorphism uh, and the carcinosarcoma is a term which is used when there is sharp segregation between the epithelial and sarcoma-like component. And the differential diagnosis include atypical fibrosanthoma and malignant melanoma. So how to differentiate? The differentiation can occur on the basis of IHC. The atypical fibrosanthomas are usually positive for vimentin and malignant melanoma are usually positive for S100, HMB45 and Milan. Coming to the next uh, variant of squamous cell carcinoma, that is varicose carcinoma. The varicose carcinoma is basically a low-grade squamous cell carcinoma. It is slowly growing. Firstly, it is exophytic, varicose, and fungetic tumor, and after that, it ultimately penetrates deep into the tissue. So, it is often not recognized as carcinoma for a long time because of its high degree of histological differentiation. So, there are three major forms of uh, this carcinoma. All of them occurring in areas of maceration. The first one is the varicose carcinoma of the oral cavity, as we can see in this clinical picture, which is known as oral florid papillomatosis. Here we can see on this little border of the tongue, this exophytic varicose lesion. It can occur on genitoanal region, which is known as giant condylomata acuminatum. It can occur on the plantar area, which is known as epithelioma cuniculatum. So these are the three areas which may show presence of varicose scar. A light microscopy for the diagnosis of varicose carcinoma we require a larger biopsy, a deeper biopsy which is essential, essential. So superficial portions actually resemble a verruca which may show hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis and acanthosis. So the Feature of paramount importance is the, brand, the bands of invasion. These strands which are invading inside are broad, they are large, they are bulbous, they are downward proliferations, and they push the collagen bundles aside. So the invasion in varicose carcinoma is a pushing type of invasion. So it is actually a bulldozing. It is not a stabbing. It pushes due to its broad strands. So 
So the broad bulbous downward proliferation is a characteristic feature of verrucous carcinoma. Even in the deep portions of the tumor, nuclear atypia, individual cell characterization, and horn pearls are usually absent. So what are the differential diagnoses of squamous cell carcinoma? First is ethnic keratosis. The difference between the squamous cell carcinoma in situ and ethnic keratosis lie in the degree rather than the type of genes. In both the condition, there is atypical cells, there is dyskeratosis of individual cells, and there is downward proliferation of the epidermis. However, only in frank squamous cell carcinoma, there is invasion of the reticular dermis. How to differentiate metastatic squamous cell carcinoma from primary squamous cell carcinoma of skin? Usually, the metastatic carcinomas show greater degree of cytological atypia. They are usually located deeper in the dermis or subcutis and lacks an overlying in situ component. The differential is pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. Usually, at the sites of trauma or presence, if there is a presence of chronic irritation, ulcer, mycotic infection, tuberculosis, or syphilis, there is reparative hyperplasia of the epidermis which may produce seemingly invasive chunks of epithelial cells. This epithelial proliferation is generally associated with dermal fibrocytic vascular proliferation with acute or subacute inflammatory infiltrate. Characteristically, the proliferative strands of epithelium are thin, markedly elongated, anastomosing and heavily infiltrated by inflammatory cells. In contrast, the squamous cell carcinoma's strand have broader width as compared to pseudoepithelomatous hyperplasia, which are have thin strands. The degree of keratinocytic atypia is greater in carcinoma. However, the presence of an intraepithelial inflammatory infiltrate, no matter how heavy, does not rule out the diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. The last differential of squamous cell carcinoma is keratoacanthoma. In favor of a diagnosis of keratoacanthoma is the architecture of a crater. So we will see a crater as discussed previously, which our sites are buttressed by overlying normal epidermis. There is high degree of keratinization. There is eosinophily glassy appearance of many of the cells. So the architecture of a crater and clinical data is of a great way. Clinically, keratoacanthoma would present as a rapid development of exophytic lesion with a central horn-filled crater. And this clinical information speaks for keratoacanthoma rather than squamous cell carcinoma. So after squamous cell carcinoma, we will come to basal cell carcinoma, which is uh, the last malignant lesion of uh, today's presentation. It is the most common malignant tumor encountered. Uh, I'm sure all of you must have seen this basal cell carcinoma in your residency. It derives its name from the cytological similarities of the tumor cells to the no normal basal cells of the epidermis. And it's traditionally believed that it arises from those cells. There are various predisposing factors, uh, which include occurrence in the sun exposed skin in direct proportion to the number of pilosebaceous units, fair skinned, blue eyed persons, and high risk. In sunlight protected skin, in the lower leg, it is associated with chronic venous stasis, arteriovenous malformation, arsenic ingestion, scars, tattoos, chicken pox, and skin injury. Clinically, the classical basal carcinoma look like an ulcerated vacuum or nodule with a pearly telangiectatic border. Usually, many of them have rolled out margins. So this is a diagrammatic clinical photograph of all the four lesions. The squamous cell showing this ulcerated keratotic uh, center, this uh, violaceous uh, red dusky hue of Merkel cell, and this pigmented melanoma. So, coming to the subtypes of the basal cell carcinoma, clinically it is divided into the most common, which is nodulo ulcerated basal cell carcinoma, which includes rodent ulcer, pigmented basal cell carcinoma, morphia like or fibrosing basal cell carcinoma. Superficial basal cell carcinoma and fibroepithelioma. In addition to these clinical five distinct entities of basal cell carcinoma, they are part of three clinical syndromes also. That is the nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, the linear urilateral basal cell nevus, and the basic syndrome showing follicular atrophoderma with multiple basal cell carcinomas. So, coming to the common features of basal cell carcinoma on light. 
So there are some common features of a predominant basal cell type. There is a peripheral pellet setting. So this is the histopathological photograph which is showing this uh, peripheral pellet setting. So these uh, cells surrounding these nests are palisaded uh, on the periphery like standing so we can differentiate this uh, peripheral palisading cells from the central cells there is a specialized stroma and there is a cleft now we can appreciate here a cleft which is present between the tumor cells and the stroma so these features are distinctive for basal cell carcinoma there may be atypia mitotic activity these uh, masses this in this nest may uh, extend into the dermis there may be cystic spaces tumor necrosis and this is a diagram which is showing these basaloid tumor cells which arise from the epidermis. So these individual cells are basaloid with scan cytoplasm, hyperchromatic nuclei. There is peripheral palisading around the nest and around the nest we can see this peritumoral clefting in between the specialized mixoid stroma and the tumor cells. So these are the basic features of a basal cell carcinoma. So from clinical point of view, it is probably more relevant to classify uh, those with low risk of recurrence and high risk of re local recurrence. Uh, the low risk of recurrence uh, is shown in nodular, nodular cystic and fibro epithelium of fingers. High risk is, uh, of local recurrence is noted in superficial, infiltrative, morphic, metatypical and micronodular type in which full excentration or full uh, excision is a doubt. So the risk of local recurrence may be related to the presence of perineural invasion which may occur in other types of basal cell carcinoma as well and to the focal nature in which the tumor may infiltrate deeply into the dermis to involve the excision march. So coming to the first subtype of the basal cell carcinoma which is superficial. So here we can see this proliferation of basal white cells which is parallel to the longitudes of the epidermis chiefly grows in the lateral position and it exhibits high recurrence rate. So this is a superficial kind of basal cell. The next is the nodular type in way where we can see this peripheral or uh, multiple nodules with this peripheral beautiful uh, peripheral palisading and this uh, to peritumoral artifact also. So uh, the there are multiple nodules with a pushing contour in opposition to stroma which is loose Stroma has a myofibroblast and may exhibit mucinous or mixoid changes. So the micronodules, uh, the nodules the nest are small as compared to the nodular type. The tumor show uh, this nest towards the surface are larger and as they infiltrate down they become smaller. So there is a deep infiltration in such kind of VC. Other is morphiform of sclerosing BCC. The infiltrating pods of basal cells are slender and they are infiltrated uh, in this morphic variety. There is more atypia as compared to classical basal cell carcinomas and their uh, stroma is dense. We may also encounter sometimes mixed nodular or infiltrative growth BCC. There is admixture of rounded irregularly contoured tumor cell nest embedded in fibrous stroma. There may be presence of mitotic figures, apoptotic nuclear debris, which characterize the aggressive growth of such kind of BCCs. So here on this photograph, we can see this mitosis. So there is both infiltrative as well as nodular type. So this is a mixed uh, variety of BCC. So metatypical BCC, also known as basosquamous carcinomas. The tumor shows predominant architectural features of basal cell carcinoma, but with a prominent element of squamous differentiation. So uh, here we can see this squamous differentiation, and in addition, there is basal white uh, features of basal white basal cell carcinoma as well as squamous element. So this is known as basal squamous or metatypical basal cell carcinoma. In fungi, bulocystic BCC are basal white tumor which. Uh, tongues in continuity with the undersurface of the epidermis at multiple points. There are there may be melanization uh, of tumor cells, which is important criteria separating BCC from trichoepithelioma or trichopolithelioma. Uh, Slit-like retractions may also be seen. So in this uh, microphotograph, we can see this melanin pigment, which favors the diagnosis of BCC and this peritumorial. Uh, Clefting and a focal perif peripheral palisading can also be seen in infantibulocystic BCCs. So there is a type 
known as uh, histopathological type, which is known as pleomorphic DCC, in which uh, pleomorphism may be seen in some monster cells, can be seen as seen in this diagram. So the other variant is fibroepithelium of pincus, which usually occurs on the back. It has a fibroadenoma-like pattern because of its acrine duct spread. So kind of reticulated pattern is seen in such kind of basal cell carcinoma. So there are long, thin branching and astomosing strands of basal cell carcinoma, which are embedded in the fibrous stroma. So this is a higher magnification. We can see these basaloid cells with this anastomosing strands of basal cell carcinoma uh, forming a reticulated pattern. So this is fibroepithelioma of pink. So the last one is the pigmented basal cell carcinoma. The melanin pigment is present within the solid islands of basal cell carcinoma and to a lesser extent may be seen in the macrophages between the islands of tumor cells. So melanin, presence of melanin pigment uh, is essential for the diagnosis of pigmented basal cell carcinoma. Coming to the immunohistochemistry, uh, the basal cell carcinomas are positive for low molecular weight cytokeratins and for EP4. They're negative for uh, EMA, CEA, and involatrin. The differential diagnosis of basal cell carcinoma include Bowen's disease, seboric keratosis, actinic keratosis, and squamous cell. So, how to differentiate from all these categories? The Bowen's disease should pronounce intercellular bridges cytoplasmic keratinization, frequent atypical mitotic figures, which are usually uncommon in cases of basal cell carcinoma. Seboric keratosis also show basal white epithelium, but there is no atypia, no mitotic activity, and they are usually accompanied by pseudo cyst, and they have a papillomatous architecture. Actinic keratosis also manifests downward buds of atypical basal white cells have parakeratosis, but they typically lack slit -like, like retractions, which are basically uh, seen in basal cell carcinoma. So, there are some subtle features which help to differentiate this differential diagnosis from basal. So the last differential of basal cell carcinoma is squamous cell carcinoma. Sometimes we may confuse it with squamous cell carcinoma. Most of the BCCs stain deeply basophilic, whereas most cells of squamous cell carcinoma uh, have an eosinophilic tinge due to keratinization. Uh, in high grade uh, cases, uh, may, they uh, may appear basophilic because of absence of keratinization, but uh, they may can be differentiated by much greater atypical cells, which are enlarged hyperchromative and have increased mitotic figures. Keratinization may be seen in BCCs also, but we have to differentiate it by the cellular morphology. So I conclude my today's presentation on epidermal tumors. Thank you everyone for your patient hearing.